Hey, go ahead and grab your Bible and you can turn to, uh, yeah, the Philippians 4. It's great to see you all today. What a great day, a day of baptisms and uh, I met a lot of new people today. We're glad that you're here, some of your guests. Hope you'll stay for lunch. You saw that afterwards. And uh, some of you might be here for Texas OU weekend, which means fall is here. It's going to be 90 something degrees today, but hey, it's coming. (laughs) It's coming. It's going to be beautiful out there. So come and join us. Don't go elsewhere uh, for lunch. Let's have a good time. Just being together, right? It's so good to be together today. Hey, I'll start with this. Um, Hiro uh, Onada was a guy that um, entered into the Japanese military. He was barely 18 years old in 1940. And he was trained to um, be uh, a guerrilla warfare kind of guy, uh, covert operations and all this kind of stuff. And by 1944, he was a lieutenant and um, a kind of officer in the military. They, um, they dropped him into the Philippines, into like a, some islands on the Philippines where he was to carry out this guerrilla warfare um, in the war. And I've been to the Philippines. I've been in these jungles and it's crazy. And he's, he's there with others in, on his team, if you will. And, um, and so when the war ended, uh, he was involved in guerrilla warfare and all kinds of things, uh, being just, you know, a pest to the enemy, all these different kinds of attacks. And when the war ended in 1945, you might know that Japan and others, they dropped leaflets down into places like this back in the day so that soldiers would know the war is over. Well, um, Onada, along with his, his other colleagues there, friends, what do you call them? Army people, men, types, in his troop, they, they didn't believe it. In fact, he, he didn't believe it especially, thought it was a ruse, a trick, you know, the Allied forces to capture the Japanese soldiers. So he kept fighting. Like he continued on. Guerrilla warfare, just creating all kinds, of, wreaking havoc and such. And um, so in 1959, he was finally um, confirmed, or not confirmed, but, you know, officially announced as, as dead. And so, like, he, he's not coming back. We don't know where this guy is. The war's over. And uh, there was a guy in 1974, a student, uh, crazy story, you can Google it, who's this adventurous guy who decides he's going to go find him. He's convinced Onoda is not, is not dead. In fact, if he, in, or if he is, we got to find this guy. He could still be alive. So he, he goes in with others, and they, they, incredibly, they find him. They track him down. He's 52 years old. They bring him back to Japan, still wearing his Imperial Army uniform. Almost 30 years after the war's over. Now, I thought that was just like a crazy episode on Gilligan's Island one time, but real stuff. This guy, and you're going like, this is nuts. And how sad is this? That he would live all that time believing there's a war going on and it's already over. Missing family, being, I mean, all the stuff, living life of anxiety and worry and, you know, I'm going to get captured and, and just on the run all the time. The main thing they told him, don't surrender and never give up to the enemy. And that's what drove him all those years. Even to the final days, they had to convince him the war was over. And here's the sad reality. A lot of us live that way. A lot of us live as, as Christians, especially we live as if the war is not yet over. Now, are there battles to fight on a daily basis? Yes, but there has been a peace that has come. Peace has come between us and God, thus us, and yes, in our own hearts and minds, and then the way that we live with others. We can live peaceful lives. Jesus promises this. And today we're gonna talk about this. Jesus said it this way in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. This is a peace that you don't find in the world. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I want to ask you, is your heart troubled today? Are you fearful? Are you anxious? Are you worried? One of the most radical traits of a believer, a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Christ, is that we live in the peaceful way of Jesus. Now, the premise of this entire passage we're going to look at the great passage, by the way. If you've been around the church much or know this passage, um, I mean, this is one of the best, especially four through seven when we get there. Philippians four, um, we call it. It's really the latter part of Paul's letter is what it is. But this, this sounds crazy. He says, Jesus said this, 
You can replace your anxiety with peace. You can actually live. There's a, there's a distinction, I must say this, between clinical anxiety and worry, which is on the rise, has been over the past year like crazy amounts, past year and a half or so. Um, there's a difference between clinical anxiety, um, which can be treated and, and then you know, needs a professional diag- diagnosis. And we want to help you with that today, frankly. About 30% of us along the way will experience a, an anxiety disorder that really needs um, some attention and, and some therapy. You might wonder, I don't know if that's me. It might be me. You know, and I think a lot of us wrestle with it. I think I'm wrestling with anxiety. You know, what, is it, what is it really like? Well, sometimes you need to talk with someone. And we're here today uh, to help you. After the service, we want to help you. And we can even guide you towards professional help. Uh, I, had a, I had a person, a friend of mine, leader, said he didn't know a healthy leader right now who's not in therapy and not seeking help from others. And I've needed help in my life along the way. I need people in my life pouring into my life, people I can talk to about what I'm going through. About 30% of us will go through really some hard anxiety disorders in our lives at some point. About 60% of us right now currently are going through a level of anxiety. And, um, and the rest of us are lying. You know, I think is how that goes. But, um, but even if you struggle with clinical anxiety, you don't get a pass on this. I'm sorry. You, all of us are called. If you're a believer, you're called to live a life of focused, centered prayer that brings about a peace because of the presence of God in your life. And if you apply this message today, friends, I'm telling you, because I've applied this message in my life through the years, it'll change your life. This will change your life. I'm convinced. But we're going to have to understand a perspective of the peaceful is what I'm going to talk about here. A posture of the peaceful and then prayers of the peaceful. That's where I want to land is the latter part especially. Let's look first at the perspective of the peaceful. Some of you will want to take some notes here. Um, You could take notes on your phone or if you brought a journal or something. This is going to be helpful for you. We end here. I mean, we're, we're getting to the latter part of the, of the book that we've divided into chapters and verses and such. But what he's just talked about is, hey, we are all citizens of heaven. If you were here last week, we looked at this. We're all heaven bound. And there's coming a day when the struggles of this world are going to be over. In fact, the struggle of your body is going to be over. You're going to get a new body, a transformed, glorified body, resurrected body. And you're going to be worshiping a resurrected Savior on a resurrected earth. He's going to make all things right. Therefore, okay, with that in mind. <laughs> so, here it is. My brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, focused on him and eternity. Dear friends, I love this. I just want to pause for a moment because this struck me. This perspective of the peaceful is that people in our lives are gifts to us. Now, he, look at what he says. You, I love and long for you. He sounds more like the, the beloved apostle John, who's so tender, so kind. He sounds like Jesus, who's transformed his life. This is, remember, this is the persecutor of the church. This is a guy formerly zealot persecutor of the church. Now he sounds like this, this loving, look at his words. He's a loving pastor. He's he, I love and long for you. And then he says, you are my joy and crown. This is what struck me this week. I shared this with our ministry staff team. I was reminded of um, something that I learned years ago in John 17. Jesus is, is, is the high priestly prayer. But if you look at John 17 as a kind of final performance review, where Jesus is literally coming before the Father and he's saying, you, you told me to do this. I'm coming to the end of, of you know, he's about to go to the cross. I, I, and here's what I've done. You gave to me these, he's talking about his disciples. Ultimately, he prays for us even. And he says, you gave them to me. He keeps calling them gifts. You've given me these. And it's like they're his joy and crown. They're his crowning achievement. I mean, he would say to the father, you told me to to invest in them. I've been glorified before. I taught you everything that you've taught me. You wanted me to teach them. Now they know. Now they'll be glorified. Now they will move forward and they'll proclaim my word. Jesus saw his disciples as his crown and joy. His crowning achievement, if you will. And that's how he sees each of us today. We are his treasure. We are his gifts. The perspective of the peaceful is to see everybody in your life that way. Think about this. Every person in your life is a gift from God. There's a reason God brought them into your life. Every person. And some of you are like, Jeff, you don't even know. My coworkers are like, I mean, you talk about anxiety. I mean, they're bringing it into my life right now. You, don't, you have no idea. 
My family's so jacked up. You have no, 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 no. Jesus had the most dysfunctional staff on the planet. And he said, these guys are gifts to me. And so he comes to the father. I present to you, Peter, wacky fisherman, impetuous. He's still wacky, but I present him to you as now one who will go on and glorify you. I present to you the beloved apostle John, my crown and joy. I present to you, Matthew, a man who, who was hated by many. Now he loves like I love him. Friends, who is your crown and joy? How will you measure your life? At the end of your life, I've heard it said this way, and they won't, I don't know if it'll happen just like this, but I, it makes sense, real simply. I had a friend of mine tell me years ago, Jeff, when you arrive at heaven, first question you're gonna get is what'd you do with Jesus? That's the first question. What have you done with Christ? Because only then can you enter into heaven if you've received his grace. Second question, what if it was, who'd you bring with you? Who'd you bring with you? Who's, who's like behind you? Who have you been pouring into? Friends, every person in your life is a gift. And we need to have that perspective. The peaceful live that way and we see others as gifts. Our crowning achievement are the people that we invest in. Who are you discipling right now? Who are you leading? And then out of this love, he says to them, stand firm. Don't give up. Who needs to hear that today? Don't give up. Whatever's going on with you right now, don't give up. So after the perspective of the peaceful, we need to take on this posture of the peaceful. Look at this. He does something rare that he almost never does. He calls out two people in the church in a letter that's to be read to everybody. Awkward. Um, uh, But but they're leaders in the church. And he says, I plead with Iodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Now this word, same mind, we saw it earlier in in chapter two, verse five. Phreneo is the word. Have this mind in you that is in Christ Jesus. Have this attitude, it could be, um, it could be translated. And I ask you, my true companion, verse six. And I think this true companion, some have said, wait, who's this? Who's the true companion? And there's other, you know, names people have brought. I think it may be as a collective, I think Paul, because he's Texan, I think he's saying y'all. I think is what it is. I think he's saying Y'all, my true companion, you all, let's get this right. We do this together. Plead with them to to have the same mind. Help these women, notable women who were key leaders in the church. These women, since they have contended at my side, they've been with me for the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of the co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. We don't know what the disagreement was, which is probably really good because we can apply it to any disagreement that we might have. Um, because evidently church people had disagreements back then. And, um, and so we can apply this to our lives today. And, but notice he doesn't say, get them to agree with each other. Now he's saying, yes, agree in the Lord, meaning have an attitude. He's not saying, I'm going with Syntyche on this one. So, so Yodia, let's, let's go, okay? Let's get, he doesn't say agree. He says, hey, in your disagreement, which I'm sure are non-core issues, or, or he wouldn't have dealt with it. I mean, he dealt with it another way. These are non-core things. These are likely like us, preferences. This is my thing, what I want. Oh, at the end of that, pride is what it is. It's like James in chapter four. He says, why do you have disagreements among you? Why are you quarreling? Because of your selfish pride and your personal preferences getting in the way. And this can happen in the church, right? And so he says, agree in the Lord. You can disagree on non-core issues, but agree in the Lord and then move forward together. This is not uniformity. Everybody thinking the same way, believing the same stuff, necessarily on non-core issues. It's people who are diverse in their understanding and experience and yet united in Christ. That's the church that we are. If you're a guest, you need to know that. That's who we are as a church. We're better together, so we stick together through it all. The posture of the peaceful is one of peacemaking. Have the same mind. We're united in Christ. And we're all, I love this, we're all heading to the same place. Your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We're going to spend eternity together. We need the perspective of the peaceful. We need this posture of the peaceful together. And I give us high marks here as a church. And then finally, here's where I want to spend my time, the rest of our time. The prayers of the peaceful. Because here Paul gives the solution to unrest and worry and anxiety. And that's where you're going like, Jeff, get on with it, because I want to hear this, this part here. You probably know verses four through seven. Memorize these verses this week. That's the homework. Memorize these. I memorized these verses years ago, and it has helped me through the years. Rejoice in the Lord always. 
I'll say it again if you didn't hear it the first time. Rejoice. Rejoice is the verb form of the word joy. It's an expression of joy. He's saying, hey, express your joy to, to one another and to the Lord. That's what we do in worship. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So be persevering, be gentle, be thoughtful with one another, okay? The Lord is near. This is a call to intimacy. Now, the Lord is with you. If you've received Christ, his spirit lives in you. You no longer are at at war with God. There's peace in your heart. You can calm down. You can be at peace. And then his presence is with you. Then he says, because of that, do not be anxious about anything. I looked at the Greek the syntax, all the language there, it means do not be anxious about anything. (laughs) That's what it means. Be anxious for no thing is literally what it says. And we read that and we go, yeah, but, like, no, he said, but, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. This, this, This is an imperative, active, present command. Don't worry. Stop worrying. End it in your life. Eliminate it. How do we do this? Well, it's key to understand this word anxious. We've talked about this a little bit. This word anxious is actually a compound word. Two, two different words. Marizo is, is a verb that means to tear or, or to split apart, to divide, to place into pieces, to split. And then, then nos is the word mind. Compound word, split mind. A divided mind. This, Jesus used this word when he says in, um, in his Sermon on the Mount, don't worry about your life. You have, don't, don't have a split uh, mind about your life. He says uh, in, in Mary and Martha's story, Martha, you're so worried, you're anxious, you're distracted about many things. Uh, he, he uses this comp- compound word is used when he says in Matthew 12, 25, Jesus says any city, any household, any kingdom will not stand if it's divided. Same word. No human being can live a life of peace with a mind that's divided. So look, anxiety is being double-minded. Your mind is divided between legitimate thoughts and illegitimate thoughts. See, anxiety is is actually um, the, the, the opposite of peace, and anxiety is believing something that is not true about God or about yourself. Often it's about the future, about 98% of things that will never happen and our minds are there. It's a divided mind. And so some 40 million Americans struggle with anxiety disorder. This is a constant thing. It's the most common mental health disorder. And it is, I mean, skyrocketed over the past year and a half. And this generation that's coming up, Gen Z has been called the anxious generation. And, and so this is something we all deal with. Paul and Jesus says the same thing. Jesus says it in Matthew 6. Be anxious for no thing, but how? How do we do this? And I want to get real practical as we, we kind of wrap up our time together. We do it uh, through prayer, he says, right? Now, you know this. Perhaps you've read this verse before. And, and we go, oh, this is good. There's a solution. It's prayer. Whew, prayer is the solution. I'm glad there's a solution. It's prayer. I feel better already. No, no, he's saying pray is what he's saying. He says pray, and I'm, I'm gonna ask you, are you praying? Is your, mark, is your life marked by prayer? Mass confession before God. Is your, mark, is your life marked by prayer? And if it's not, no wonder you're anxious. And, and many of us hear, well, Jeff, I get it, and I want to pray, and I pray some. I pray sometimes. How do, you, how do we do this? Jesus, look, the word says in, in 1 Peter 5, 7, uh, Peter says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety. And here's what we do. We, we, okay, Lord, I'm here to pray. Jeff says, I need to pray. I mean, I know it's, I'm supposed to pray. I'm praying. Lord, just, oh, and I, I give you this. Lord, I'm anxious about this, and I'm worried about this, and I got this thing going, and I've got, gosh, I'm getting, wow, I'm, I'm, getting more, I'm getting more anxious as I pray. And now I'm really anxious. I got all this going on today. That's, that's not what we're talking about here. We do cast our anxieties on him, but we, we don't, that's, prayer is not simply telling God all your stuff. So this is what I want to help us with today. See, anxiety functionally says something false about God. And prayer in the Bible is always marked, the, the language in the Hebrew and the Greek, prayer is always uh, two things. It's, it's worship 
and it's bowing down, literally, bowing before God. This is how prayer is, is described, the words that are used for prayer in the Bible. Worship, okay? So prayer, again, is not simply, now's my time to sit down and tell you all my stuff and what I'm worried about. We'll get to that. It's, he does say to do that. Let your request be made known to God. But here's the thing. You see, worship, I'd put it this way. You can't worship and worry at the same time. And so prayer first starts with worship. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who, what? Art in heaven, what? Hallowed be thy name. When you come to prayer, you, you center yourself before a holy God. My, you're my Father. Just, just dwell on that. And, and I'll just tell you what I do. I practice contemplative prayer it's called, it can be called centering prayer, centered prayer. And what it is, it's simple. We're all beginners at prayer, by the way. And I'll begin again tomorrow in the morning. I'll pray tonight. I mean, we're all beginners. Every great prayer that I've ever read from Martin Luther, all the great ones, you know, you go, that guy probably had it. They all know we're all beginners in prayer. So you're in good company to come before him yet again, but you've got to get centered. It's, it's not simply coming to him. Yes, we let our requests be made known to him. We, our request, let your request be made known to him. You don't, you don't demand that this thing go this way, and if it doesn't, then I guess prayer doesn't work. That's what we do. It's not name it, claim it. He says, bring your request before God, and you might say, well, doesn't he already know what I'm dealing with? That's why a lot of people don't pray. Well, God knows everything. I don't know. I don't know how this works. Look, you're, you're not informing God in prayer. You're conforming to God in prayer. Prayer is not dumping all your stuff on God. It is, yes. Cast your cares on him. We'll get there. But first, it's coming before him. You see, you might say, well, I'm not a very good prayer. No, 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 no. Listen, a good prayer is one who prays. The biggest reason you don't have prayers answered in your life? Prayerlessness. That's why. And I hope this is convicting your heart because I so want us to be a people of prayer. I want you to experience his, his, his presence in your life. Here's what I do. I'll have a time apart from everything in my life and I do it early in the morning. I don't know if you're able to do this. You say, well, I got kids. They're running crazy. Okay, maybe you get up at four. Okay, before they get up. Um, 4 a.m. or something. Or, or maybe there's another time. But you've got to have a time in the day where you get centered before him. And you can do this throughout the day. Pray without ceasing. What I do, I'll sit down with my Bible, my journal, and I will just, I'll just sit before him, centered on him. This will seem a little weird at first. You might just need to take a deep breath. But in doing so, you're fully present before the Lord. Lord, I'm, I'm totally here. Attention is, is the beginning of devotion. Focus is the beginning of worship. Many of us can't worship because we're not focused. Many of us can't pray because we're not focused. You've got to be disciplined to say, Lord, I'm here. I'm present before you. You might even put your hands out like this. You'll say, Lord, I just empty my life before you. I just, I just recognize your presence right now. You're my father. I mean, just literally do that. And, and, and I'll, I'll often pray then. Here's my prayer always. And when I come into worship, and Lord, remind me again of how much you love me. Remind me again. And then listen to him. I'll do this throughout the day. You can do this. I can sit, be sitting in an office. I'm getting ready to go in a meeting. Lord, just calm my heart before you. Uh, you can get in your car before you go to your next thing and just stop for a moment. Here's what I'm doing. Here's another rule of life. Two things. One, rule of life for me, no phone on till I've been up at least an hour. I'm trying to push that longer. I've stopped using the apps on my phone for devotion time and Bible reading and whatever else. Nope. Enter into presence, the presence of God. And then another rule of life I'm seeking to follow is to, is to move slowly. This has helped me. Again, I know I'm weird, but this has helped me. I'm not running to the next thing. I'm going to try to slow down. I'm going to try to have some white space in the moment. Because I've got a lot going on in my life. Jesus was very busy. He was never in a hurry. And this comes with a centered heart. You center your life on him. Be quiet before him. Calm down. You know how you enter into soulful rest? This will blow your mind. By resting. How do you enter into Sabbath? By Sabbath. How do you enter into restful prayer and peace? 
by coming into his presence and say, Lord, you are here with me. And then friends, listen, when his presence comes and his peace comes, don't be surprised by it. Embrace it. Don't be surprised by the promise. Look at verse seven. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Guard your heart, what you feel. Guard your mind, what you think. Focused, not split, not divided. Focused in Christ Jesus. So you're with him, you're in him because now, see the Bible tells us in Colossians 1, you were once alienated, you were enemies of God. But he's brought you back. The the war is over. He's fought the fight for you. You surrender to him. You were reconciled by his physical body through the death to to, to present you holy in his sight. The war is over. The battle's over. That's where peace begins. See, people say, well, coming, you know, when you become a Christian, you have a relationship with God. No, no, no. Listen, every person on the planet has a relationship with God. You are either disobedient in your sin, hell bound, sons and daughters of disobedience. Or, that's your relationship, or you are saved by the grace of Christ, son or daughter of the most high king, heaven bound, Christ having died for you, his spirit living in you. You have a relationship with God. Which is it? If you've not received Christ, it's the former. And friend, no wonder you have anxiety in your life. You have much to be worried about. You give your life to him. And then it says in Romans 5, 1, the same Paul writes this. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, not by our works, we have peace with God. We have peace with him. And this peace is actual, his presence in our lives. Prayer is not the end game. Prayer is a means towards his present God himself. This is why C.S. Lewis said, God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself. Because it is not there. There's no such thing. You don't get it unless you come to him. Friends, today, if you're anxious, come to him in prayer. Please, I beg of you. This week, develop a new rule of life. Have a a time in the morning for me. I mean, I can do this. I, I get up early in the morning and I spend time with God, being set again before him. Lord, remind me again of how much you love me. I'm going to remember that. And I'll pray that all day long. To have centered prayer, focused on him. Friends, listen, it's available for you. The war is over. But what do you do when your life is completely, for some of you here, maybe you're going through the hardest season of your life. We heard the story of our our dear friend John Parker last week. and, And the Bible says, even Paul says in Philippians, look at examples among you. And today we thought it'd be good to close with an example. I'm going to come back up and we'll close our time together in a special way collectively. But um, we thought it'd be great for you to, to watch this story of the Roos family. Some of you know Trisha Roos um, and her little Annabelle. Now, this is a story of losing a daughter, um, the death of a, of a little baby. So I want to say that up front. It might be tender for some of you if you would rather not uh, watch this. But um, it's the story of God's faithfulness of his peace, and how he guides us through the most difficult seasons of life. Watch this. So our story about our daughter Annabelle is a big part of our testimony and a big part of who we are. We were pregnant and started going to the doctor's appointments and everything appeared normal. However, at about 12 weeks, my doctor suggested if we wanted to know a little bit more, we could do a blood test. And that blood test came back that she was positive for trisomy 18. We didn't know what trisomy 18 was. And of course we referred to Google and found out that most literature calls it incompatible with life. So as you can imagine, our life was crushed and we were scared and we were sad. We were extremely lost. And after seeing a specialist that confirmed the diagnosis, he recommended that we terminate the pregnancy. We wanted to continue to let God write her story and whether that meant it would be a stillbirth or a miscarriage or we would get to meet her only for a few moments, we were ready and prepared to do that. So at the time, I was also the head volleyball coach at a local high school and we decided very quickly to tell our coworkers and my volleyball team about the diagnosis. And in that volleyball season, I had teenage girls working together selflessly for a much bigger purpose. And we won the state championship that year and they dedicated that whole season to Annabelle. About a month and a half later, we delivered Annabelle at Baylor Hospital 
For the doctors and nurses, that was the first live trisomy 18 birth that they had experienced. And within four minutes, we heard no breathing, and then all of a sudden we heard a cry. And so we knew that she was alive, and they got her to my chest as quickly as possible. And from there, I feel every single day we were shocking doctors and nurses. They had no idea how she was even alive because she had a two-chamber heart, and they hadn't even expected her to make it two minutes. And so many people, I believe, in those days were changed and impacted by her short life. And we were able to bring her home, and she died peacefully in my arms at six days old, which of course was extremely difficult. But through that entire experience, we knew in our hearts that we had done what God asked us to do, to carry her full term and to take care of her and love on her. And although her life was only six days, we are so grateful that we had her in our lives and were able to love and care for her. When God says have the faith of a child, he displayed what that looked like. Cameron prayed every day. Well, I know mom that you're saying that she may have to go to heaven, but I think she's gonna stay here for a while. And of course, when you're hearing that from your child and his faith, but then you also know that you have to be prepared if that doesn't happen. But I remember when we brought her home from the hospital, he ran out of the door with his arms open and said, I told you God would let her come home. And it's just, so interesting because we're like, why did we doubt and why were we so scared when he believed and he prayed for it and he knew that it would come true? So that was amazing to see through his eyes. In 2015, Park Cities actually filmed our story and we were able to share about our daughter, Annabelle. And I so vividly remember that because I was extremely nervous about speaking about it. I was still in a very vulnerable place where I felt like I could cry at any moment and break down in the middle of the interview. And I remember when it did air at church, I know exactly where I was sitting in the back left corner and I was crying through the whole thing. And now six years later, I can say that I can sit here and confidently tell my story about hope and about love and about faith through tragedy because God has used our story to help others. And I don't think that I could have come this far if it wouldn't have been for the Park Cities community and for our family and our friends and just constantly exploring our faith and learning about God's word. Lately, I think that when I was called to write a book and start public speaking, I was extremely overwhelmed by that call and I questioned if I would be able to do that. And I think that for me, there is peace in knowing that if I can help make an impact and share my story and help others find peace and find understanding that Annabelle's life will continue to be valuable. And I think that, especially for anyone that's lost a child, you want that child to be remembered and you want people to know about them. And I think that keeping her memory alive and letting people know that even though we didn't get the miracle and her heart wasn't healed and she's not on this earth, doesn't mean that that wasn't still God's plan. We are so used to fairy tales and everything has a happy ending. Well, we still lost our daughter, but it's still beautiful because God wrote a different kind of story through us. Wow. So I was one of the blessed ones to have met Annabelle. And I uh, got a front row seat to watch the Russes walk through this together, and we celebrated her life. We tell the story again today because, uh, of, as Trish noted, uh, over time, you know, the Lord starts to reveal things in the way that he works. And uh, Trish is actually going to be in the commons um, with her book. I'd love for you to get it. Uh, it could be really encouraging for you and helpful for you, all of us. So go and meet her and tell her thank you. We're so grateful that they would tell their story today.